we have a supply and demand connection problem. And in the middle sit community colleges and training systems. Now, post-World War II, this was a push system that was driven by, on the supply side, a K-12 education system that prepared people for either college or vocational training and would push them into this pipeline of preparation so that employers on the demand side, who already knew what the jobs were, could catch them coming out. It don't work that way anymore. Jobs are evolving at a different pace, and so we now have a system that works somewhat in the reverse. We have what should be a pull system with employers saying, here's what I need, here's the specialties that have changed. It's not necessarily a degree. It might be a credential. It could be stack skills. This is what I need. Let me pull it out of the system and create a pathway for the supply side. It doesn't work either. Let me explain why. And this is where I don't, I might offend a few, but I think this is, this is the problem that we, have, that we face today. We've never made the shift from the push system. The demand side lost faith in the ability of the pipeline to deliver, so they stopped feeding data into it. Employers today do not feed the data into the system the way they used to. We don't know what to train for. And when we do know what to train for, we've not reverse engineered the curriculum or the credential stacking. On the supply side, when you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. Imagine being a high school student and only seeing, as it started very much in the 90s and through the knots, college is my only option. And liberal arts is this, and I might be medical school for that or lawyer for this, but you lost that ability to see a pathway to what a career could be or what the beginning of a career could be. And while you may have entered in one career, you discovered other things you were good at in that process. Well, that's been removed. In the middle, the community colleges, the training system, held hostage from both sides, unable to work with the K-12 system because there's no pathway. Remediation becomes a huge issue. The demand side not feeding data, not communicating what they need. And oh, by the way, funded through a system that doesn't give a damn about the supply or the demand side when you really get down to how money flows. So other than that, this workforce system is tremendous. <laughs> that is my simplistic definition of what the problem is and why we're having this workforce disconnect between supply and demand. So with that, let's go to the panel. And Dante, are you getting what you need? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> um, no, there's a big gap, as you said, David. Um, you know, the mobility space is, is super diverse and interesting. There's a lot of companies that are, have long histories, and there's a lot of new companies with long futures. Um, we see gaps in, you know, every, every company now, and it's not just mobility, but every company now is becoming a digital company. And with a digital company, you need software. And software, sci you know, computer scientists, electrical engineers, that's the big squeeze. That's the big, for us, that's the big, that's the big gap right now. Um, and, 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 it's, and, and if that gap was just existing, um, you know, in one of our regions or another, that's one thing, but it's very universal. But we have a compounded problem. Some of our people, and the governor said this on Tuesday, some of our engineers don't want to be in Michigan. And that's another hurdle that we're facing here because our R&D center, which is an engineering firm, of course, is in Michigan. Our manufacturing, of course, is elsewhere. But um, so that's a. That's why, why don't they want to be in Michigan? But the, let's see the answer to that question. The, the, the new, <laughs> they, they want more flexibility. They want to work from home. Some people want to work at the office. Some people want to work from home. And some want to be with their family or their spouse. And their spouse is somewhere else in another state. And so that's, um, we're competing with that. And with this remote from, you know, work from home, remote work, this hybrid work, um, a lot of people, a lot of, of our employees that are seeing, and I've talked to other employers too, they want to not be at the office. Like I said, some do, but so, you know, many don't, and they don't want to be even near the office. They don't even come to the office once a quarter. You know, they'd rather just use it as a business trip it just once or twice a year if they had to. You know, treat it as like a, just a business trip, you know. Um, so that's, that's uh, we're, we're, we're competing with um, other companies or spaces or family locations that are elsewhere in the company. 
uh, uh, so elsewhere in the country. You know, University of Michigan, which is our kind of our, our home in Ann Arbor there, um, you know, over half of their people come out from out of state to go to school there, and m most of them go back outside the state when they leave. So there's a big pipeline crunch right now for us. Um, and it's not just, you know, and again, it's not just Michigan, but we're seeing that compounding effect. Also our headquarters in Plano where we do our um, uh, autonomous uh, driving connected, connected technologies, they're also finding a pinch. And Silicon Valley as well, where, where we also have a presence. So it's, it's everywhere. But. Wow. Dr. Ivory, you, you're the longest serving community college president in the region. But don't remind me, please. <laughs> <laughs> You have been dealing with the assumptions that the supply side is ready for community college and the assumptions that this system works for employers. And um, frankly, it, it hasn't worked in a lot of years. How, why is that and how do we assure as we're dealing with this issue of placement that we're dealing with the equity question as well? How are we assuring we're, we're moving people along the pipeline that that perhaps have not been in the best schools or, or perhaps have been left behind by other issues? Yeah, let me say, uh, first of all, uh, let, me, let me thank um, the, um, you, Dave, the, the, the Chamber, uh, the, the Ralph Wilson Foundation, the Bomber Group for uh, encouraging this, this transformational moment because I do think it's a transformational moment uh, in terms of uh, the need for collaboration, and this is, this is a huge step in the right direction. 85% of the students, 85% 80, 80, of the jobs will require some education beyond high school. It's been an interesting paradigm shift, but I think the paradigm shift has been, been, been progressing for a while now, and I think we've come to recognize that we have a lot of work to do. 60% uh, of the students we receive at the community college um, are, are not coming to us as prepared as we would want them to be. And then we get that 60%, about 25% of those students are, are completing within six years. Now, and, and it's not unique to any one institution. I think that's for the most part across the board. Um, and I would say that um, the community colleges, we have one of the best uh, community college systems in the country here in, in Michigan. I'm, I've always been so proud of the work that we do. Uh, in terms of the talent gap, I'm one to always say that I don't see it as much as a talent gap. Uh, I see it more as an opportunity gap at times, and I think I have to emphasize that as we talk about equity. Um, equity the issue of equity, equity, equity became more pronounced during the pandemic. We recognized that the things that we needed to do. I met you know, and uh, not the person real name, a young lady named Charlotte. Um, um, and she talked about um, how desperately she wanted to be in school. But she had to drop out because she could not afford daycare. She could not afford transportation. She had, uh, didn't have health care. Uh, all kinds of issues that precluded her from staying in school. Now, that story repeats itself over and over and over again, but it's about equity. And uh, we've, we've uh, got to pay attention to that. So, and we can't always address it by talking about remediation. Because what does remediation do or developmental ed do? I mean, you, you, we ask some students to take non-credit courses, which means they're going to extend their time in, in college uh, or, com or in terms of completing that degree. For, for an extended period of time because now they're going to be taking classes that don't necessarily, um, uh, they're not credit classes and won't count toward a degree. And sometimes it, it forces them to, to uh, not be eligible for financial aid. So, but the issue of equity is huge, it's large. I don't think it ought to be the, the end all. It ought not to be the one thing that we, 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 we hang our hat on but I think we have to pay attention to it if we want to address this whole uh, talent pool issue. And I think that the school's got to do a better, better job. I'm, I'd be the first to say we've got to work harder, do a better job. But I think our private partners also have got to open those doors, look for internships, uh, look for cooperative kind of, of, of um, um, opportunities that get um, our young people into the workforce. And I think we can be creative in doing so. I, now, what, what tools can be used? I, 
one conversation that's been had on the island is the notion of earned income tax credits. The legislature is talking about them, et cetera. Is that, is that a tool that helps address the equity issue? It's one tool. It's one tool. Uh, I, I, I would, and I think that anything that encourages encourages um, one to be involved in the, in the uh, workforce is, is a positive. Um, um, however, it, it, it comes with some, some, some areas that uh, probably need to be addressed, but I, I certainly would never find anything wrong with talking about anything that would encourage uh, one to be involved in the workforce. Anything we can do to encourage um, um, work is, just it's hard to be critical of that. So I don't, I, I would say yes, um, um, the earned earn income tax credit is a very positive tool. Great. Kim, um, the state 60 by 30, you're trying to help repair that connection between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. So um, Governor Whitmer um, has decided that at, in consultation with a whole bunch of folks, including philanthropy and others, how important it is that we address talent. And I know that I've been in this space for a long time, as you know, um, Dave, and for a long time, I felt as though we were kind of speaking to people, to people in all sectors who weren't really listening about talent. I mean, the business community has been saying for a long time how important it is for us to have talent and to have a plan for talent, not just saying it's important and just check a box, but to really have a, a plan. So we were so happy to bring on Sarah Shapiki, who's sitting up front, um, to run our 60 by 30 office. Um, Carrie Ebersawsing, who you, who I think many of you know, um, ran it before her. Um, the idea being that we need to have 60% of our um, working adults in Michigan um, to have a post-secondary credential, whether that be an associate's degree or a certificate, um, we need to make sure that people have those credentials because the business community needs it. Um, we need it because we really recognize that a rising income is really what we should be aiming for. We need to have a state where more people make enough money. I, you know, part of my job is also running the property task force for the state of Michigan. Um, our our um, we, people are not making enough money. And we know that education, I'm a true believer in the power of education to um, not only, I mean, we, we know that there are all kinds of outcomes that you get when you have a more educated populace. Um, ed, um, better jobs is just part of the story. I mean, there are better health outcomes. There are all kinds of different ways that um, having those credentials help. So we're being strategic about working with regions in the state of Michigan to have them have their own goals. Um, you know, I want to just have a gold star for Oakland County that has its own um, goal that they are making tremendous progress towards meeting. Um, and we really want to work with leaders in regions all over the state to have them, because we're doing it on a statewide level with programs like Reconnect, which is a program that gives um, free college tuition to people ages 25 and older. We may be having a change in the age um, that might be coming up um, who want to return and get that credential. Um, Futures for Frontliners, which was kind of our um, uh, best way to describe it is a um, um, kind of a, uh, an issue, a program that we had to help uh, those folks who were on the front lines of the um, economy when the rest of us had the luxury of, of staying at home, they went out and worked every day, whether it was pumping, you know, getting um, our cars to work, whether it was working in the hospitals, um, who don't have that credential, giving them the opportunity to, to um, go back and get that credential. Um, so we really um, are trying to be really strategic about not just putting money on the table because as Dr. Ivory said, we know that folks come to us with um, a tremendous amount of competing interests. They have families that they have to raise, so they need money. So it's not as easy as just going back and getting a degree. They have to be able to support their family while they do that. So wraparound services are really important. And so we're trying to um, really kind of find a formula, have uh, we have navigators that work with us with our reconnect program that are intentional about within five to ten days of people signing up, calling them, making sure they understand how the FAFSA works. You know, really being having hands-on 
um, contact with them right away, making sure they're connected with their advisors back at the community colleges they're attending. So, you know, we think that those kind of things will be helpful to people like Dr. Ivory's team so that they can, um, you know, that transition is more, is more smooth. So um, we're really excited about those programs. Of course, COVID has been a challenge to us in some ways, um, although um, we feel momentum again now. We have already had about 2,000 people who've already earned um, credentials um, through um, futures for frontliners. Um, so we're, uh, and, and uh, Reconnect just started last year, but we have momentum on that. We've had several people, we've had um, um, hundreds of people who have gotten uh, the associate's degree, and then we're having people who are going back to get those credentials too, and cr those um, certificates too. And those certificates are important. We're trying to really be strategic about finding those certificates that employers are looking for. So just really um, trying to ensure that people are plugged in to both of those programs and that people have ownership of this goal, this statewide goal to get us to 60 um, by the year 2030. So again, the earned income tax credit, is that, is that a tool that is going to help as you're looking so, at clients coming through the state? I am a huge supporter of that. Um, as I mentioned, I also run the Poverty Task Force for our um, state, and that, I would say that's probably our number one priority because we know that it works. It had bipartisan support for, for many, many years, and we've seen it work on the national level through the federal EITC. Um, um, lawmakers here made the decision to cut the match here in Michigan from 20% to um, 6%. We know we need to get back up so that people are getting more of those dollars. And it's helping the business community. There's a, a reason why there's such momentum. The business community wants this too because they recognize it's a tool to get people back um, to work. So um, there is no downside to increasing that EITC match. And we think it's um, critical for our state so that we are um, giving support to the people who need it most. Great. So Kylie, my, my partner in crime on the philanthropy side, mm -hmm. The Wilson Foundation and the Balmer Group combined don't have enough money to fix this system or change this system. Um, but we're working on a few things together. Talk, talk about philanthropy's unique role. Yeah, well, Dave, first of all, it's been a pleasure to work with you and your team uh, on the Detroit Drives Degrees Community College Collaborative, but also members of the panel here. I mean, to your point, uh, we don't have enough resources. One thing I love about Balmer Group's philosophy, we believe that government is the largest philanthropy. So we partner <laughs> with the state of Michigan, with Oakland, Wayne, Macomb County, the local municipalities, because we know that what we have is a drop in the bucket compared to what government can do. And so how do we incentivize collaboration, use our flexible private resources to incentivize collaboration? between government, nonprofit, and business. That's what we're about. Hey, talk, talk a little bit about, about D3C3. I have to stop every time I before I do that. <laughs> it's much easier, though, than Detroit Drives Degrees Community yeah, College talk. Collaborative. But <laughs> talk about its purpose and how it's structured. Well, we got involved with you guys because, one, we believe wholeheartedly that community college is a pathway from K-12 for many of our um, <coughs> in southeast Michigan. And what I really love about D3C3 is that it's a way to help centralize a decentralized system. I sometimes look at my colleagues in California where they work in a more centralized system and I say, oh, if we only had a more centralized system here, maybe we would see better outcomes. And what D3C3 has allowed us to do is really bring together all of the community colleges in the region, um, organize them based on some national principles uh, that have come from Georgia State uh, University, as well as some clusters of different uh, areas of focus. And so I'm hopeful that through our investment and partnership with you, the chamber, and the members of uh, the team here, that we can all work together to have more centralization to get to better outcomes for residents in the region. Great, great, thank you. So we're gonna turn to the audience uh, for questions. There'll be a couple of microphones roaming. Uh, COVID protocols, so um, the, the microphone has to be held by the, by the staff person that has it, and they need to, they'll be wiping it off every time. So this is another way of saying, we're not gonna hand you the mic and let you talk. Um, <laughs> but, but now we have COVID as a great, great reason to do that. So questions <laughs> from the audience. Mary. So 
So one of the questions that I have is in the system that you, you started the session, Dave, talking about supply and demand, basically. And having some experience covering education as a young reporter and then being involved in education institutions and watching, part of the magic, I think, that for community colleges, flexibility, I think it's very hard for four-year universities to be really nimble. Um, but I, but I, also re, uh, uh, I also think maybe I'd like to hear a little bit about the challenges of trying to get faculty to be flexible. And, okay. and, and to not think in the semester format, to think in badges or certifications. And, and community colleges, depending on the program, seem to have good relationships with employers, but that's not universal. So I, I, I just want to hear how you're looking at that challenge, because I think, it, I, I think it's a challenge, but maybe I'm wrong. Great, great question, Mary. So doc, Dr. Ivory? Are, are we still in traditional formats, or are we flexible? I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I, um... Somehow I knew I'd get that course tonight. <laughs> the the, the um, faculty certainly over the last two years really, uh, they were about resilience. They did a tremendous job of being able to be flexible, to pivot. They embraced the, the hybrid um, model, um, I mean personal and, and online stuff. They did some, some, some incredibly creative things, to, um, uh, I don't know that we, we would have made it without that level of flexibility from faculty. And I think they will continue to, I think this has been a learning experience for them, all of us. Now we know that um, we can get things done. Uh, again, this past two years demonstrated that in our faculty, and I, I would say all over the country really, been very flexible. Uh, and uh, we could not have done it without our faculty. It's, COVID has certainly added to that. We've had to right. make some That's special right. dispensations. Dante, as you're looking at Toyota, are you looking for a degree, a certificate, a skill set? What's, what's the criteria you're looking at, and what do you depend on community college for in delivering that in terms of this flexibility? Dave, we'll take anyone. No, I'm, well, uh, um, <laughs> okay, we're not that desperate, maybe, but um, no, four-year degrees, of course, are common in my area in engineering, um, but, you know, I, was, I talked to our um, chief, uh, engineer, chief engineer for um, our um, connected technologies, and he says, you, we don't need people from MIT and Harvard to, to program. You know, we don't, you don't need those, you don't need everyone to have those degrees. So we're looking at community colleges to also feed this, this interim step where there's, there's some coding knowledge, but they can work a little bit more with digital tools and, and programs and, um, th that we build in-house maybe even. We need people more digitally you know, proficient, more, more um, fluent, fluency in digital spaces. And community colleges can provide that space. Um, we also rely on community colleges to help upskill our current staff. And whether that be mechanical means such as welding or refrigeration, uh, but also uh, software knowledge, problem solving, communication. These are all skills that we all need to have. Um, so community colleges also uh, can fill that gap. And of course, as companies need to be more attractive, I think community colleges have to be more accessible. And when we look at K through 12, the whole pipeline, uh, we, need, we need to in, you know, introduce these, the, you know, the STEM careers as something exciting, as something sustainable, as something that can push you in the future with, with a good quality of life. Um, and, and some you know, exciting careers. I think K through 12 have to be, you know, to introduce those topics. I think community colleges have to do, you know, to be more accessible. And then companies need to be more attractive. And we all need to have the message, you know, communication. We need to communicate that message better. So, so back to that notion of a push-pull system. The demand side of the equation wanted to manage the outflow of the pipe by creating a filtering system. Mm -hmm. Typically, do you have a degree? Do you have an associate's degree? And what I've seen from the employer side of, the, of this equation, they still have those in place. Is that true at Toyota? Is there still a screening mechanism, or has your HR department been able to say, no, we've got to have this skill set stack, not necessarily that degree? There's still, there's still some, you know, there's still that thinking where we need a degree. When, when we say the word engineer, that's a degree. Right. Uh, but I'm working to create an interim. So we have technicians that do a lot of testing, a lot of hands-on working with product and, and testing those. And then we have engineers, of course, designing. But there's more and more of a gap between those two. The engineers more and more are at their desks or at home 
or in a different state. <laughs> and we more and more we have technicians, they have to be with the tools, the products, you know, hands-on with the equipment. And there's this divide of, of, of labor. And so I'm trying to create this, this interim labor, which I'm calling an engineering specialist. Um, it's n nothing official yet. I hope nothing leaves this room. <laughs> nothing, nothing's been official in our company yet. Don't, don't worry, but, Dante. We're but, streaming live. It's OK. <laughs> no one tell. Oh, oh great. <laughs> You know, but, the, but the engineering specialists that people may have a four-year degree, they may not, they may have a two-year degree. I mean, we have people that are very, very sharp and talented that have two years of, of, of college. And, and some of them are better than our people with master's degrees to be actually practically working. I mean, it, it's very mixed up. So we can't be strict that way. So I really want to have more of a continuum where we fill the space and the needs more. We, we need to we need to have you translate that for a lot of other employers. It's so uh, great to hear Toyota's thinking in that way. Other questions? Yeah, hi, Justin Remington from the Michigan Education Excellence Foundation. We do some promise funding. Uh, I would stand up, but I spilled a breakfast burrito all over myself. <laughs> so I'm going to stay seated. The, the question I have is around, and Dante started to touch on it, as we think about you know, this supply and demand need, and right now there is this massive need for workforce. But I think sometimes what we often forget about is when you look at incarceration rates and others, you know, we don't always take into account um, neuro divergency and mental disorders and some of the things that not all, all uh, kids can be carpenters, not all can be plumbers. And so where does this talking about aspirational vision and what you can be, you know, yesterday in the Skillman session, we heard from three incredible teens who are well on their way of being entrepreneurs. So where does that fit into all of this? Great, great, great question. Kim, how, is, how are the programs you're working on dealing with that issue? Well, I think that um, it's going to require uh, we all know that COVID has shown us that the world has changed and the way that we have to approach education has changed and the way we're approaching credentials has changed. And um, we know that um, we have a number of very talented people who are facing barriers that prevent them from getting the credentials that we've always um, recognized as being important and participating in the um, workforce the way that we um, have, have wanted to do that. So I think it's just going to require tremendous um, creativity. Um, the way that our poverty task force works is that we have 14 state directors at the table. So we have the Department of Corrections. We have workforce development. We have um, DHHS. So trying to figure out how all of these different departments in state government can serve um, to be kind of um, um, a um, uh, almost um, coming together to, to come up with innovative solutions using their background so that we can um, address some of the challenges that you you're, you're talking about. Certainly, we recognize that people learn differently, that even what you learn um, and the way you learn it, um, kind of skills-based proficiency, um, as, as Mary alluded to, are, you know, are things that we need to look at. I mean, I will confess to being um, I'm, I, I walk, worshiped at the altar of Lou Glazer for a long time, as some pe other people in this room have. And so I'm, I am a person, and I served on a university board. I'm a person who has a deep appreciation for four-year degrees. I should put that um, on the table. However, I've had to change my thinking in some ways because I have to look at reality. And we recognize a two-year degree is critically important. Certificates, when they are developed in a way that um, both meet the need of needs of the um, of the uh, workforce and are um, really enhancers. Um, the, College is not just about learning a, a trade that you practice. I and mean, we know that the economy and the workforce is too dynamic for that. I mean, what you learn in engineering school two years down the road could be completely um, you know, extinct or defunct. So, How many people with JDs practice law? Right, exactly. Right. So, um, so we have to be recognize that learning really has to be a lifelong um, pursuit. And, to, and before we talk about kind of the, the end of that pursuit, we have to really be more <coughs> intentional about the beginning, that K-12 experience, that pre-K-12 experience. Um, that has to be part of the conversation. Right. And so we have the Department of Education at the table. Um, and, and that's how we're approaching our work. We recognize it's not just something that's going to come out of the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. All of these um, departments of state government have to be at the table, as well as partners in philanthropy and um, certainly the employers. Right. And, and Kylie, Bomber Group's been working 
at that aspirational side of the equation. Talk about those programs. Correct. So what I really love about some of our learnings is that we realize that this is not the end, as Kim mentioned. Just having that exposure early on in the K-12 system, career work experience, or grow Detroit's young talent, and even talking with the lieutenant governor this morning, he said, you know, Kylie, it shouldn't just be over the summer, right? Grow Detroit Young Talent, wonderful program, but how do we work with employers more closely to provide these internships, apprenticeships, you know, throughout the year so that when uh, children are making decisions on where they want to go, is it a two-year, a four-year, or directly into the workforce, that they are making an informed decision. And so we're investing a lot in uh, career tech education programs in the K-12 system, we're looking at, um, again, career work experience programs, but really partnering with employers. Two employers here now, GM, Barton Mallow, Toyota. You know, how do you work with them to build these relationships beyond um, just summer programs and make them more long-term? Great, great. Next question. Hi, Panita Thurman with the Skillman Foundation. Um, Kim, also as a fellow disciple of, of the Lou Glazer vision for, um, <laughs> For four-year degrees, I really want to stress the question of equity, right? We're talking about how do how does K-12 and workforce and how do you keep these pieces working together and would love to hear from you. While it's great that MDE is at the table, our system in Michigan is really fragmented around accountability of ensuring that the most vulnerable or most underserved young people are actually progressing through K-12 and through higher ed and wonder what you see as possible for how government can be coordinating and holding both a vision and an accountability to make sure our most underserved are served to their fullest extent. Thank you, Panita. Yeah. That, that's a really good question, Panita, and I would say that um, one of the things that we're hoping to do, you know, we work obviously very closely with the community colleges. Um, as a former university board member, uh, accountability was really kind of paramount for the particular board that I served on. We talked about um, having one of the worst graduation rates, six-year six graduation rates in the nation. Um, we have to look at what are those disconnects that are preventing us from having college success. So um, when we look at de designing programs like uh, Reconnect, uh, where we're giving money to these um, community colleges to be able to produce, we really can't just look at it as being punitive. We also recognize that we have to also give supports to those colleges and to those students. Um, part of the, we all know that students uh, bring their whole selves to the to the educational experience. So we can't just talk about what happens between eight and three. We have to have those wraparound services for their parents. It has to be a multi-generational approach. And so we're really trying to, as we um, come up with programs um, and as we get into the next generation of programs like Reconnect, how do we, yes, boost accountability for the colleges that we're working on, but also work with them to address societal problems or problems that are within the purview of state government um, so that it's not just um, the stick, but most certainly the carrot too. So, so on that note, um, you mentioned outside of the time in school, we're gonna see the state funding more after school program? Um, I think that the state recognizes, well, that's the power of partnerships with philanthropy, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, we recognize that, you know, those hours are critical outside of the classroom. And so, um, you know, one of the things that's in our department that um, 60 by 30 works with is our MySTEM program. So trying to boost programs that are, yes, within the school, the regular school day, but also boosting outside of um, that eight to, eight to three period. So that, you know, when we talk about education as an ecosystem, yes, it's a, it's a after school program, but it's one that's exposing more, and it's an equity play too, because it's, expo it's exposing students who might not have access to the kind of STEM learning within the classroom um, ordinarily, but it's really kind of incentivizing schools to have those, um, those STEM opportunities. So those are the kind of things that we're doing when we talk about um, really, really boosting um, both after school and during school um, early injection of uh, kind of STEM, the, those jobs of the future, so that they even know what the jobs of the future are. We're, we're still learning what the jobs of the future are, but that has to um, trickle down to our K-12 teachers, to students, to counselors, so that um, they, 
have a, a clue that, that those kind of opportunities even There's a navigation exist. system and a connection. Absolutely. It's a great point. Dr. Ivory, how is, how is the, your community college working in the K-12 system on, on connecting better? What, what, and what could we do to, across the community college system, make better connections and accountability to that system? You know, the, 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 some of the conversations, and I'm, 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 I'm thinking about California, they have this interesting campaign uh, where they're working with parents, trying to have parents have a better appreciation for what the workforce is look, looking like now. And uh, I think particularly as we talk about skilled trades and for uh, uh, people of color, it, it's still not as, it's still somewhat of a struggle to accept that, that, that the workforce now uh, the the courses the, the programs in terms the skilled trades are as as um, as uh, attractive uh, to some 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 populations that they out as they probably should be, and, and because for so long uh, parents of color could I mean they, they they could only look to skilled trades and so now they're saying well I've worked awfully hard now and I've saved for my kid to go to college and now you're telling me that that they can't go to the Columbia, or they can't go to University of Michigan, they can't go to the, the, to the tier one universities and Ivy Leagues, and they've got to now do the welding thing or the, uh, the other kinds of skilled trades. That's the real struggle that, we, that we're having right now. It, the skilled tra it's not a sexy kind of concept, construct for, for a lot of students, and so they're passing up just a tremendous opportunity, and that's, the, 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 the thing that I, I find that's um, a, an interesting struggle. In addition to that, the cost. Uh, for community colleges to embrace the skilled trades like we probably would want to, um, it's gonna require more money because um, skilled trades is a very costly proposition. And it's not like the liberal arts. You're talking to liberal arts, you know, you can offer your English and your and your, your history and your psychology, and you take those, those liberal art classes, you're not talking about, it's not capital intense, you're not buying a lot of equipment. You're not, so those are the kinds of things that I'm saying that we need to talk about and, and, um, and uh, offer better solutions. Next question. Randy Fernandez, I'm the city manager of Marysville, Michigan, and I'm, but I'm also a trustee for St. Clair County Community College. So first of all, I want to thank the governor's office and Kim, those two that you talked about, uh, frontliners and that, that helped, okay? Everybody's heard of the Kalamazoo Promise, right? Okay, now's the time for the community college promise. Why can't philanthropy work with Toyota and uh, Ford and, and, and GM? I mean, we've got, right, the current president has pushed a nationwide two-year community college hasn't taken hold yet, but why do we have to wait for the federal government to do it? Why can't our state be the first one with the <clears throat> community college? I promise, state's sitting on billions of dollars right now from ARPA funding and other things, all right? But that, you wanna create a legacy, you wanna attract talent, you've got to, so, you know, help Dr. Ivy, uh, Ivy help our president. Uh, the lady to my right is from Schoolcraft College. Why not start now? The opportunity is there. Jill Biden, right? She's the right community college uh, professor, things like that. I think now's the time. The Kalamazoo promise has worked. It's attracted business there. People have moved their kids to Kalamazoo because of, because of that. Why couldn't we attract the Michigan Community College and get people from other states to move here? Thank, thank you, Randy. So, Kim, can you get that through the legislature, perhaps? Uh, well, I, met, I noticed he mentioned philanthropy. So. I, well, I, I noticed I'm ignoring that, yes. Uh, but oh, but well, a, a, a fine point. Have we, have we invested enough public and philanthropic dollars into creating this pathway? It is now the time to do it. Well, I mean, I think programs like Reconnect, I mean, are designed to do exactly that. I mean, we're hoping to attract more. I mean, uh, certainly there are people who stopped out who, or are there people who never even considered college before who are doing it because they recognize now that the jobs of the future and the jobs of the present require more than you get from a high school diploma. So um, I do think that we're moving in that direction. Um, I do think we have great opportunities. I think that we need to 
um, be, uh, we're, we're working to uh, get, as I mentioned, this regional approach so that uh, leaders in counties like Oakland County, where Dave Coulter has been really intentional about working with the community college there, with the four-year university there, with the trades unions there, with the K-12 system there. We need to have it at that level. I mean, yes, we do need a state vision, and we have one. I mean, I, I really feel very optimistic about um, you know, our goal to get to 60%, but we recognize we've got to do it um, one community at a time. So I think that uh, there are communities that have a template for how you make this work. We just are, look for Sarah to come to your community one day soon <laughs> to get you, to get other communities on board with that local investment. And then the state is standing there with tools like Reconnect and Futures for Frontliners to um, help power those kinds of, of partnerships that are necessary. Great. Kylie? Dave, I just want to weigh in on this because Kim makes a wonderful point around the regional aspect. Everything happens locally, right? I mean, the state can only do so much. And so that's why the collaborative that we're supporting, the D3C3 collaborative, is all about working at that local level, right? Having the community colleges come together to work together to get to better outcomes and where the state can lean in and the local municipalities, that's what should be happening. But it, it should definitely start at the regional and local level. Great. Are there other questions? I, no, great, one over there. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Greg. Um, hey, a couple of comments. Hey, community college, the pathway to more equitable economy. Can't emphasize enough the importance of community colleges. Too many, uh, individuals go to a four-year school not knowing what they want to study for not the right reason and economically and we need to capitalize on our community college a lot more than what we are today to uh, spend our dollars and get better education but we also from a, a business side a partnership uh, a not just philanthropy not just uh, a, our, our school systems but a business is being proactively engaged in mentoring co-ops, sponsorships. And I, I, last point, you comment about skilled trades. Uh, bragging a little bit, our COO came up to Carpenter's rank two weeks ago, graduated from the Harvard 11-week MBA program uh, as a group leader, and it's not a job, it's a career that businesses can offer and a trade job can be a starting point, but the emphasis needs to be a, car a career in what training and development of businesses so using the community college and all these other aspects is an opportunity we need to capitalize. And we co collectively and co uh, collaboratively need to work together to provide opportunities and make Michigan a better economy. Great, thank you, thank you Ben. Dr. Ivory, are you getting the type of uh, support and collaboration from the corporate community, the business community, that you think is necessary to, to heal the supply-demand gap? Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I, I certainly think that the private sector, our private partners want to make it work. Uh, we're having a lot of discussions. They serve on advisory um, panels and advisory committees for our particular skilled, skilled trades. Yes, I, I think we're getting there, and um, in collaboration is obviously uh, uh, the one word that we need to really embrace and and, uh, and and do everything we can to do more of it. Great, Dante. What's Toyota doing with with the community colleges in that regard, and the K twelve system for that matter? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, so first on the community college, uh, Toyota uh, was a co-founding uh, partner for uh, Fame. Federation of Advanced Manufacturing Education in Kentucky. Very, very helpful for our plants. We're bringing that to Michigan. Um, uh, and uh, it's starting, the fame, uh, it's starting with the Washington Community College uh, next fall, so the fall of 23. So that is going to be, um, you know, and the, the, the technicians or the two-year degrees we have in R&D, yes, they're not, we're not talking about thousands, so the numbers are not big, but we do have technicians in prototyping and technicians in maintenance that can really benefit from, from that program. So we're really excited to bring that up from our manufacturing know-how up to Michigan to use it in our R&D site. And so that's one. And it won't just benefit us, that'll benefit other companies as well. And then K through 12, Toyota's really excited about, and I think other companies have similar programs, but new this year just announced, Toyota is, is called Driving Possibilities. It's, Toyota's putting $110 million into working with K through 12 
STEM programs in the 14 operational communities we have in the United States. Um, and our first, uh, we're modeling what we have in West Dallas at an underserved or underprivileged uh, STEM school pre-K through eight. We're gonna replicate that in Michigan in, in our, for our R&D site. And again, uh, because this is one of our operational communities. Now, whether that be um, in Washington, Washington, call it, uh, Washington um, County or not, that's up to, um, you know, it's being studied right now. We're looking at the needs, we're looking at who can collaborate with us, and again, pre-K through 12 to really, to really excite that. So that's gonna be exciting to announce when we have more details on that, but that's, that's, um, that's a big deal for, oh, for us. Great, uh, that'll be terrific to see the program come here. Russ. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> thank you, Dave, and thank you to uh, all of you speaking on behalf of us as a, a region and a community college system. I, I want to respond to my, my colleague, um, who is a trustee in, in St. Clair, um, and, and just say um, the idea of access to community college is something that the people on this stage have nearly completely accomplished. And I want to say on behalf of Henry Ford College, thank you. Um, if, if you want access to a community college in Southeast Michigan, you have Pell Grants if you're below the poverty level and that will cover all of your cost of tuition. If you're a graduate of a Detroit High School, the Detroit Promise will cover all of your cost for tuition. If you're over 25 years old and you want to reskill, now uh, this governor and this legislature have given you a path to community college across the entire state. And if you worked on the front lines, as uh, Kim mentioned, you had an opportunity to get a uh, community college at, for free. So access is something we're making really good strides on as a state and as a region. Where we need to go in the future, and I would encourage my colleagues who are watching this to um, think about helping us as community college leaders take the next step, requires two big, big next steps that we're at a disadvantage and we're losing the fight in this, the national competition for talent. The first is we don't get enough of our students through the system. Our graduation and completion and success rates are too low and it's embarrassingly low, so you should ask your community colleges to have standards that we must meet. And if you want to look at ours at Henry Ford College, you can look at it. It, it, it. We're not proud of our graduation rate. We've said it publicly, and we're going to try and make it better. Every community college in Southeast Michigan should be able to do that. And second, employers need to help us by coming together and showing our students where those jobs exist. And we should be able to give you the skills you need. These folks on the, ta on, on the dais here have helped us get to this place. But as a community, we're going to have to take on those two next big barriers. And I'll just say, Balmer and Ralsey Wilson Jr. Foundation have taken that seriously, and I appreciate you convening the conversation. Great, thank you. Russ, thank you, and thank you for stealing my conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we cannot emphasize enough the need for this to be a seamless connection from employers to community college, from K-12 to community college, and heal that middle space. So, so thank you so much for those remarks. Greg, we have another question. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, you're doing a great job with uh, the issue of uh, education and training and prepare the workforce uh, to the future. Uh, but I see another problem I'd like to hear from you about it. The employment rate nationally, it's a 3.6. It's a low. It's mean we don't have enough human resources to fill those jobs. In Washington, for the last 10 years, 12 years, they tight the immigration flow to this country. We used to give 2 million and a half, 2 million point seven uh, a new immigrant, most of them below uh, the age of 40, to add to the workforces. Is if that trend continue and we educate our kids for better jobs, where are you going to get people to fill up the jobs? We have shortage now in every area. You go to a restaurant, you go to the police department where the kids used to dream to be police officer and firefighter. Uh, we, in, in Wayne County, we have 200 positions and the sheriff department empty, we can't fill them in every police department. So the, ad, it, we need to address the shortage of human resources in this country before it get out of hand and we start seeing factory and business shut it, shutting down because they can't find people to do the job. So, so from a data perspective, are we, are we, do we have enough data to know where those jobs are and to start, well, I, I love the term reverse engineering when I think about this instead of degree granting. 
can we reverse engineer those open positions and start stacking skills, Kim? Well, I think, I mean, that's one approach, but I, I wanted to speak more about what he was talking about with Please. the importance of, of immigrants, because I see that Poppy Hernandez is in the room from our Office of Global Michigan. That is very much a part of our agenda when we talk about 60 by 30, because we need to have Michigan not just be a welcoming state, but a state where people come and get educated as they do, but that they stay. And so we're really trying to be more intentional about um, having partnerships with our four-year universities, with our community colleges, with employers, so that that talent that we're getting from other countries, because we are trying to create a state that's very welcoming, will get trained here. They're coming here, you know, we have an amazing um, college system here in Michigan, and people want to come here and be educated. What do we do to keep them here? And so um, it, it is really true that in order for us to get to that 60 by 30 number, um, you know, when you look at the demographics of where we are with, you know, birth rate and, and, and other things, factors like that, we have to be creative. And it's not just going to be us getting more of the existing population to have the degrees, but we have to get more people people um, into this state and, and have the people who come here to be educated um, to be sure that they stay here and, and that this is a state where they would want to stay. Right. And veterans are another one that continue to haunt me. We're not. Is it a lack of a navigation system? Is it a lack of a pathway? Why aren't we seeing vets in particular find well, their way into these open jobs? Well, I think that we are. Um, we, I think we have a really um, dynamic leadership um, with veterans now with the state. And I think that we, there is a recognition that we have to um, have a sense of what the training needs are and what the needs of um, employers who want to hire veterans. What do we need to do as a state to make sure that those connections are happening? And I think that we recognize that that's something that we need to do and we are trying to be more intentional about doing. You'll be hearing more about that. Great, so. great. Back to, back to the notion of openings. Toyota got a lot of positions it can't fill, Dante? Yeah, we have a lot of unfilled positions. And you know, as a legacy company, we also have people working in traditional automotive spaces still. We're still making engines, we're still making transmissions. But we're, we're bridging, we also have to be ambidextrous, and we're now designing battery packs and motors and, and all the electrification parts of the car. Um, so we are allocating talent inside the company as much as we can. Uh, Toyota is known for not laying off people or, or workforce. Our workforce are very stable and uh, one of our you know, tenets of respect for people. And so we're taking our, our top talent. You know, if you're a good engine engineer, in, in my area especially, they can be a great battery engineer. There's no, diff there's no reason why they can't be. Good engineers are good engineers, and that's what we need. But as we pull people from our traditional technologies to our new technologies, we're creating holes that we need to backfill. And that's hard to draw people in. So we're, we're having a hard time to draw in people into the new spaces, because that's where we're competing with the, the Teslas and the Facebooks and the Apples and the Rivians. And it's hard to bring people into the, the, the t uh, traditional spaces, because who wants a traditional space in a new age? So those are the two fights we're doing right now. If we're going to bridge this supply and demand issue in all of its complexity, what, Russ already stole most of it, so. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you want from the corporate community? What do you want from policymakers to make this work better? Kylie, let's start with you. Well, you know, as I mentioned, from our perspective, we have wonderful employer partners that we've been working with. Um, we're looking to understand the skills that are needed so that when we fund K-12 initiatives for career exposure that they align. Um, same with our community college partners, understanding who's in that pipeline currently, can we help our employers fill open positions. So I think it has to be employer driven, Dave. I mean, honestly, one thing about, I think, uh, cooperative work experience opportunities is that you learn from employers very early on what their needs are, the pipeline. And so we're going to continue to fund in the K-12 space uh, based on what employers are sharing with us, as well as in the, the post-secondary space, again, based on what employers are sharing. Great. Kim? I just feel optimistic that this conversation is happening, and it's happening broadly. I mean, we. This was not something that people always recognized as a top priority for our state. And so the fact that it has been 
um, you know, surfaced as something that both the business community and um, the state have prioritized, I think is, is a good first step. Um, I would just say everyone in this room has a role to play, um, you know, whether it's philanthropy, whether it's the media, whether it's, um, you know, our uh, school systems. I would just ask everyone to kind of evaluate what your institution is or is not doing um, because policy can't just be something that comes out of the minds of a bureaucrat like me, or I don't, I'm not really a bureaucrat, but I'll, I'll, play, <laughs> I'll play one on TV. But, um, but it can't just be something that we're coming up with. We have to continue to have those conversations. And so I'm really excited that those conversations are happening and that not just conversation is happening, but real policy is coming together and we're starting to see <coughs> results from it. And I think the future looks bright on that front. Great, Dante? Certainly, human capital is our, our most important resource and uh, will be the determinant that, you know, of the rise and fall of our company and any company. Uh, so, in, as true as David said in the beginning and uh, true with the Toyota production system, we believe in the pool system. So, as Kylie said and Kim said, companies have a lot to, to do with that. So, we need to pool correctly. We need to clear out our future needs. Um, and the, the pipeline, you know, it, we have to look upstream of the pipeline. And Toyota's doing that, other companies are doing that. The pipeline is only as strong as its weakest link, right? So we're gonna look there for leaks, for constrictions, for strange cr curves, <laughs> you know. That pipeline has to be straight and, and flowing, so we're gonna reach all the way back. You know, we started with four-year degrees, we've always, we've always had that steady relationship, but now we're looking at community colleges, but we gotta get people to community colleges and graduating from community colleges, and that's the K through 12 program that we're doing. So that's, that we have a lot of responsibility there. Great, Dr. Ivory. Thank you. I, I would just hope that we would be careful with the narrative. Uh, again, I, I've had the good fortune of having worked in a lot of different places and uh, written and discussed and, and researched a lot of different institutions. We have a very good system of community colleges in this state, and um, and I and I think we're all doing a pretty damn good job. Um, and I don't want it to be over. The, uh, we shouldn't become overly simplistic in terms of what uh, completion means. I mean, that there are a lot of variables that influence completion. And when I when I when I when I hear us talk about completion, and I look at the numbers. I mean, it, we're all at about between 14 and 21 percent, and that's not a lot of, not a lot of distance there, in terms of completion. But let's consider the the equity issues and the variables that influence that. We want to do what needs to be done, and I can tell you, we're delivering in a very serious way. Are we going to get better? Yes, we're going to get better. Um, we understand the 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 the, the important pipeline issue. And, and in terms of talent, and we're going to get there. But when you look at what we're doing in this state, I want us to be proud of what we've been able to accomplish. A lot of institutions, a lot of states are looking at what we do uh, for direction. And uh, I'm proud of that. So community colleges and the chamber have entered into a partnership with Detroit Drives Degrees Community College Collaborative. The focus is on some specific industries to start, but how do they create a collaborative, creative, innovative way to pull people through this pipeline and meet demand? Um, we're excited about that, the Wilson Foundation, and our partners at Balmer have, have been at the table with us. The community college folks that are here and participating, could you just raise your hand so we can all see you? So these folks are doing that hard work, and I'm excited to uh, announce that the Wilson Foundation is going to commit up to $20 million on this innovative collaborative. To meet the demands. And, and Kylie hasn't have a number yet because we're still working Steve and Connie over. Um, but you put in enough, Dave. You don't need our. <laughs> But I, I know Balmer's been at that table as well, and, and uh, we, we think this is a beginning, but it won't work without the employer side feeding demand, driving that system, and it won't work without the supply side preparing students, showing pathways, and the community college system itself busting down old cultures and becoming more nimble in how it approaches this work. So 
I'm thrilled to announce that. I'm delighted with this panel. Uh, help me to thank them.